This is a Momentum Media production. Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. Well, g'day, how you going? Phil Tarrant, co-host. Investing insights with Right Property Group and as our great guitar riff there. I don't know if we need to update this. I don't know. We, I quite like the music. It gets me into the mood. Um, and for those of you who don't know, and you would have just heard that intro, we actually play it before we actually uh, get talking on this podcast because a number of different reasons. It reminds us what we're doing, but also gets us in to the rhythm of property investment. And much like a good guitar riff, Steve Waters, who's shaking his head, co-host and Victor Kumar, property investment goes up and down and left and right. And you've got to string the chords together to get the right tempo, the right beat, the right music uh, to give enjoyment to the masses, mate. So you're good. I don't know where you were going. I didn't know where you were going with that, but that was good. But, um... it, it may, the, the, the melody of, um, of property investment is sometimes property investment is thrash metal. Uh, sometimes it's the Packerbell canon and, and classical music. Sometimes it, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to listen to. And sometimes it's a headache uh, of the death metal that you probably play on a Saturday night with your uh, your homemade drum kit in your garage, Steve, um, belting out the tunes. That's probably investment to me. Yeah, so when when you, when you look at it, uh, Phil, especially when you're hosting, what you're trying to say is that this podcast is absolutely strung together. It's absolutely strung together. I would have thought it was uh, a, a pitch-perfect harmonic balance, Victor. <laughs> God. Yeah, there you go. Well, anyway, anyway, you anyway, it's, it's, yeah, it's thanks blue, for listening. It's glued, it's glued together. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of band aids just to hold at least to hold the three of us together. And how how this has stood the test of time, I, I don't know. We've been doing this now for four years, five years. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're into our fifth season, Victor. And for some reason, we're still able to talk to each other and and, and find at least some commonality of enjoyment. I guess that is property investment. If it wasn't for property investment, I absolutely wouldn't be friends with you guys. Uh, it's pretty clear and simple. Yeah, the only reason I'm friends with you, uh, Phil, is that you get the free coffee. So yeah. This is right. Well, I haven't seen you for so long, Victor. I thought we are going to be in the studio today, but we're still using uh, the Zoom. But, you know, it's a great neighbour. It's getting it done. But um, back to the point, you know, if this property market was – one of the great songs of the last, it's a question for both of you, of the last 20 years, 30, sorry, 50 years, let's get back to the disco era and that, what would it be considering the the hysteria that's um, encapsulating property investors at the moment? Vic? Well, it'll be a classic that never dies, right? It, it, it is evergreen and uh, stands the test of time. And uh, really, whether you are new generation or an older generation, you'll still relate to the song. So what's the song? Don't know. <laughs> it depends on your tune and depends on what, your mood. Uh, so, something that is irrelevant 50 years ago is, is just as relevant just today. Just as relevant. Just I'm as just relevant. trying to think what songs uh, my kids listen to. And I listen to this. Here we go. I, I This is my song. I've just worked it out. I used to listen to this song when I was in primary school. My kids are in primary school now. It's We Built This City by Starship. There you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's actually yep. pretty good. You like that, song. Steve? I, that yeah. was actually... <laughs> That's that's very good. And I'd love if we had a, a forum for the podcast or something along those lines where people could respond and say, you know, what song corresponds to investing or their journey yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it may so be. Send us send us an email on questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au and tell us what your investing song is. Yeah, we built this city on Chico Rolls. <laughs> built, built this. Well, if you listen to some, it'd be built this city on Cheap debt, cheap yeah. money, yeah. but um, nonetheless. But we're still we- building this city. Well, we're in Sydney, still getting built here. They're talking about the six cities thing now in, in New yep. South Wales. Uh, the state budget's underway. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Treasurer Keane is uh, getting that all sorted out. Um, well, big news there spending, too. Spending money all over the joint. Yeah, big news on the budget. Yeah, at the time of recording with the first homeowners, stamp, oh, stamp duty. Brackets first homeowners. The trigger has been pulled on that. We've talked about this for probably 18 months now, maybe mm-hmm. a bit longer. I think they're going to trial it with the first homeowners to begin with. Obviously, the details are a bit light because it's yet to be properly announced. But wow, the second biggest barrier to entry for first homeowners now gone on a payment plan, mind you. But at the initial it's buy now, pay later for property. Well, zip pay. Zip proudly, pay for property. Proudly sponsored by. Mm. It, um, Probably shouldn't say that because they're all capitulating 
the buy now, pay later. Uh, oh, they'll tell you it's not credit, Steve. That's the reason why. It's not credit. So no, it shouldn't no, be regulated on not. credit cards. No. Yeah. But look, it's a big, it's a big moment, I guess, in time. There are going to be lots of people that just say, wow, well, here's my chance to get in. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. whether it be coupled with other grants is yet to be seen. It's price seal or the ceiling price is 1.5 million, and that's huge. That opens up vast areas of most properties in a well it's the average isn't it yeah. it um statistically speaking there are those that are against it and there are those that are for it and i think that probably comes down to an individual appetite from a business model from new south wales state government i actually think it's not a bad move you'll go backwards to go forwards mm. but in, in perpetuity wow it's but, something but this is be- the issue though and I, i've been sort of Try and form my own opinion on it all, guys, and um, and I sort of it lends itself to this this debate, and a lot of people are coming out now saying, you know, this isn't going to help affordability. What what's going on in the market right now? And prices coming back, and this hyperinflation, all these sort of things, isn't going to change the affordability equation, and and sort of removing that as a requirement of the initial purchase price to get into property of of not having to pay a stamp duty. Yeah, it means that people are going to get in the property sooner. Um, that means you're going to have more people probably with a bigger deposit because they don't have to allocate that bit to stamp duty. So what's that going to do to prices in those areas where first-time buyers are going to be operating? Okay. I don't know, well, I just on that, sorry, Victor, steal your thunder. I'll speak before you. I think if you had have gone back six months ago, 12 months ago with the first time on a stamp duty scenario, I'd probably agree with you. Uh, that savings would have been absorbed or, sorry, included into the price very quickly as the market would have just perpetuated even in a more stronger fashion. Today, however, because of the higher rates, because of the burden on borrowing, so the higher the rates, the less the serviceability there is, I don't see it perpetuating the market. I think you could probably argue that it'll help being one of probably three or four other components to put a floor in the market. Now, that, Good point. Yeah, that that's taking into account or having an assumption that rates don't sort of escalate out of control, and some would argue that it may, but it's just a another piece to the jigsaw which will help. You take that component with the stamp duty in combination with the lack of accommodation, which we've been banging on about for five years now, the timing of it probably couldn't be better. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And um, like you said, Steve, any government incentive, any change in how you're able to buy a property or what assistance you get generally gets taken up by the market really quickly in terms of price increases or availability of properties. And um, I guess the balancing point over here is the rising interest rates, which perhaps may automatically push people down in terms of the level of affordability as to whether they can go to the 1.5 mil or or lower. And certainly with the way rates are moving and the way Reserve Bank is sounding uh, the uh, the message to say that we'll brace for more interest rate rises, it will take a slow and steady approach of people getting into the market. It's not going to be like last year where if we've got, got this sort of incentive that people will jump in left, right, and center. Mm-hmm. I think people will take a, a measured approach and jump into the market when they think they are truly ready and when they know that they can actually afford the repayments. Because just because there is an incentive, and, and apart from the stamp duty, in New South Wales, you've also got the incentive of, uh, you say, the medicals, the teachers, where uh, there's going to be a shared equity scheme uh, with the government, where the government will, the state government will give up to 40% assistance to these professionals. When you have that in combination, there's certainly moving the right direction in, in terms of getting people into property ownership. However, what are the flow and effects? You know, especially when you look at generally people tend to own their properties for perhaps five years if they're not not getting into a planned approach. Will there be a big turnover in five years' time when people really decide that, no, this isn't the right asset for me, I'm going to move on to the next one and sell down? Yeah, potentially. I think in relation back to the stamp duty scenario, though, I believe, and once again, the, the devil's in the detail, which we don't have yet, that it's attached to the property, not the person. Mm-hmm. Yep. So therefore, it's there forever. But also, if we sort of think a little left of field here, 
is the state government saying to themselves, well, yes, we are going to go backward in, in terms of revenue before we can go forwards and accumulate the book, the residual income, if you will. Are they preparing themselves for the mass immigration that is needed? And if I play that out, and both all governments have said we need immigration like we've never seen it before, as I've, as I've said many a time, they ultimately become purchasers. So initially they'll be renters and the the majority will probably go to Sydney and Melbourne in terms of international migration into Melbourne and Sydney. And so Sydney state government said, well, we're going to get a big portion of this immigration. Eventually they're going to, a lot of them are going to become buyers. We've got a rental crisis or an accommodation crisis. The timing is probably never better to mm-hmm. implement that strategy. The $22 trillion question is will other states follow suit? And, and that's the big thing, Steve. And you're already seeing a play out now. Uh, a lot of people are saying uh, a New South Wales trying to get the jump on other states as a, an attraction. They could try and stem some of the leakage of people up up to the north to, to Brizzy if they can make it cheaper to buy a home in New South Wales. Hopefully they can keep it. I, I know quite a lot of people pretty senior in the New South Wales government, and they've got some pretty bold plans about making New South Wales, Sydney, an attraction destination um, well, to retain but also attract people into it. And fortunately, this is often where most people land when they arrive in Australia if they choose to call Australia home, um, which is good for Sydney. So they're saying that New South Wales is getting the jump on other states and other states will have to follow suit pretty quickly. I note also, I don't know if you guys have seen it, how you know the competition for rental properties up in Queensland is so strong that the Lord Mayor is trying to hike the um, – rates for people who have Airbnb properties trying to get more rental properties yep. on the market. So th- this is an issue. But my overall, and this is a, a podcast for property investors, um, from those who are starting out to those who have significant portfolio, we're talking about housing affordability for first-time buyers or, or for new Australians. Like, okay, what does it mean for property investors? Well, this stimulus says to me that the government is shuffling its deck and property is at the top of its deck in terms of investment. The government at state and federal levels now has or will have considerable skin in the game to make sure that property values continue to go up or at least hold firm. And that's the catch-all for me. So as a property investor, I go, well, if the government's backing it, they're going to want to try and make sure it doesn't, um, you know, as an asset class, um, dilute its value like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, hold on. It's funny that you mentioned that because like Bitcoin, which to me is a speculative asset. I, there's no value to it other than what someone is willing to pay for it. Yeah. Are there, and I'm not bagging it, I've just, I've just got really no opinion because I don't understand it enough, yeah. but it's a speculative asset class. Has there been a large portion of property purchases that had the same approach, that being speculative, over the last two years? Because you know, that whole FOMO scenario, cheap credit, got to get in, got to get in, because you know, we can see on the social profiles everyone's becoming a you know gazillionaire within a short amount of time. My fear is that some people went into property without any foresight, saying, Well, yeah, if this happens, if that happens, and we get back to a normal market, will I be in a position to hold firm or is it because I'm a speculator? I'm only here for a quick buck and I'm in and out. Yeah. And Steve, that's a really good point and it lends itself to really the thrust of, of how I want to shape the remainder of this chat here is that you look at the, the hysteria that's happening inside of the um the crypto coins at the moment. You see Bitcoin's under 20 grand, uh, 20,000 bucks. Like, you know, it's down a lot. Um, there's a lot of hysteria in that market, but I would say there's a lot of hysteria inside of. Uh, property markets and uh, maybe some of it led by people who were playing that speculative game. They they not uh, haven't been traditionally a real estate investor in those last couple of years. They've gone all right. Well, I'll put some money into property because it seems to be rocketing along in value. Those people who just follow fads. Let's be clear, property was a bit of a fad for the last couple of years and for the FOMO investors. So, you know, the key things now is if you are a property investor, 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 investor. <laughs> a, pro- a property imposter, and property imposter was what I was actually trying to say. But a lot of, I think, a lot of people have been property imposters. So I would say that their portfolios now are pretty fragile. Whereas the the property investor, the real property investors, want to be building agile. Um, portfolios. And, and and that is how you can shape or buttress uh, your approach against hysteria that's taking on right now. I, I'm not hysteric about property. I'm going, 
happy days ahead because I've got an agile portfolio that's been built well, a lot of it through you guys. Um, you know, so how do you know whether you've got a fragile portfolio or an agile portfolio? That's the big question. It is. And I think that the easy answer to that is somewhat, can you sleep at night mm. with the current changes? And if you drill down further, will it be really, the question is, is it about the asset value if you're, you're in an area that is contracted over the last you know six to eight weeks? Is that a concern to you or is it the cash flow? And I bet that in most cases, if not over 90%, that it'll be around the cash flow position. Now, let me be clear though, cash flow is in the eye of the beholder. You know, everyone has that different and unique set of circumstances. But ultimately, it'll come down to, is this now going to affect my lifestyle? Will I be living on Jats Crackers and Chico Rolls because I can't afford to pay the mortgage in combination to be fair with the rising cost of living, of goods and services across the world? So if the cash flow position is there and you're still well within your buffers, as we often refer to, then you should be able to sleep well. If, however, you've had a speculative approach where you haven't balanced the numbers or balanced your portfolio and you've been tilting towards all growth and not even being concerned with the cash flow position, then you, potentially you might be in a, a little bit of trouble. And it, as I say that, I go back to when I first started. And Vic and I started in and around the same time. Maybe, Vic, you had a year on me, I think, because mm-hmm. you're five years older. <laughs> um, that... Um, and I fell trapped to that myself. I remember when I first started, it was, and I'll I'll preface it by saying there was no one like us around, or there wasn't this part of the industry as it exists today. It was, you know, take an American book and try and Australianize it to our system and then suck it and see. Have a go and see how it goes. Because there was nothing around in terms of education unless you wanted to be ripped via some of those headline acts from back then. And I felt trapped to the where, well, the the growth is my equity position. My equity position is my wealth position. Money was relatively cheap at the time compared to, I think it was, I think I was paying around about seven or 9% way back. Yeah. Back then that was cheap. And, but it was free flowing. The credit was free flowing. It was the beginning of the low doc loan. So how much do you want? I'll have that sign here, press hard third copy is yours, here's your money. There was no real verification. And that was the system back then. And so I just chased growth and I had phenomenal growth. But I quickly realized that the cash flow position was like the oxygen I needed to sustain the debt and sustain the lifestyle should things turn around. And from that moment on, and we're going back to 2001, but I realized that the cash flow was once again like that oxygen. And I quickly pivoted before I needed it. My fear for today is that people have fallen into that same trap. Now, because Vic and I went through that same thing and we learned those lessons way back, that's the strategies that we deploy today is say, look, you know what? Growth is very, very important. That is our wealth, but so too is the cash flow within your own requirements. So you continually need to be adjusting for the what ifs that always happen. So let me say that again, the what ifs always eventuate. And potentially here we are again now. So those that were those that were chasing nothing other than growth and not concerned with the cash flow, there'll be a portion of those that'll be caught with their pants down. Yeah, absolutely. And and I agree, Steve, that we, we both made that mistake in the beginning where uh, automatically we are we are gravitating towards how much growth can we get, how much growth can we get out of the portfolio, how much growth can we get out of this property. And um, back those days, uh, you know, these data were at the back of a magazine, which was already outdated by the time we got to it. And the reality is that this is where, when you're looking at it from a property investment point of view, there are two facets to this. One is your wealth, your long-term wealth, which is your growth, your equity position, and uh, basically your asset value. The other aspect of of it is your lifestyle. And the lifestyle is equated to the cash flow situation. So I'm not talking about positive cash flow. I'm talking about how much cash flow does the portfolio take from you on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, before tax, so that you know that if you've earned your money, PYG, as an example, you need to allocate this much of your cash flow and therefore this much of your lifestyle money 
towards holding your assets, which is which is part of your long-term wealth. And as soon as you've got those two things cemented in your mind, you can't go wrong, regardless of what the property market phase is, what, what the interest rates are, uh, what the uh, new fad is in the in the property investing arena, you will always be bedded down and have strong foundational approach towards property investing. And, and therefore, you'll keep yourself safe from the general and, and known fluctuations that come as part and parcel of property investing. That's a good point, the known fluctuations. And I think that's another trap as well for a lot of people is they think the property grows in a lineal mm. fashion and it, it just doesn't. And we keep talking about that. The trajectory is up over time, but you do have those fluctuations. And it's during those moments of flux that if you aren't prepared to either exploit opportunity or survive, then you'll become a statistic. And that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. And we see it time and time and time again. Phil, the other day when we were on a Facebook Live uh, that we hold on every second Thursday, and, and you happen to jump on. Yeah, did you like that? Dropped in. There was. Slid, slid into your direct message. The gate crasher. Yeah, the wedding crasher. It, um, but you you mentioned something that was was really important, I guess, is because when you first got started, we were at, at the end of a GFC, or the tail end of a GFC, where there was still negative consumer sentiment mm. throughout the entire economy across the world, uh, but you managed to you know, bring yourself together way back because, let's face it, there was that was the beginnings of everything, yeah. and you jumped into a market well, you know, with education and so on and so forth, but you didn't wait for the market to be halfway up the face of the wave. You saw the opportunity and you acted accordingly, but yeah. you were prepared as well. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's a mindset thing, and you know, I, I don't want us to be the merchants of doom and gloom, saying there's going to be casualty in, in this market. And also, well, yeah, um, there's casualties in every market, even good markets. There's casualties. If you make the wrong decisions. This is about whether or not your portfolio is, is agile or fragile. And I like to think most people who probably tune into this podcast have probably got agile portfolios because they're investing in their education. It's pretty easy to get property right. It's pretty easy to get it wrong. And and what I find is the people who who get property wrong, property investment wrong, are not those who are investing in their education. They're not getting good situation awareness. They're not getting strategic ideas and planning. They're not being tactically smart. That's the reason why I use the buyer's agent, right? But, you know, mindset is, is fundamental to all investment decisions. And going to the point that you made, Steve, um, I was happy to get in the property because I'd done my homework and I'd got the right people to help me out going down that pathway, buyer's agent, mortgage broker, uh, accountant, et al. So, you know, you need to have a good relationship with change and a lot of people fear change a lot of people hate change a lot of people are scared of change a lot of people try and duck and dive change um you know but you said steve that you started in in 2000 you know you think about the known what ifs you know and there's this whole thing around known 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 unknowns unknown knowns and unknown unknowns right you know um garden gnomes garden gnomes whatever it is so (laughs) you know what what you can (laughs) What you're guaranteed in property is change, um, and and there's a lot of a lot of things that are out of control, a lot of things inside your control. So it comes down to mindset. So I was happy to enter the market uh, at that point in time, Vic. But when you look at how things are changing and this awareness of or acceptance of change in this market, it's probably a big step for most people to go through. Go through that step because you can't change it. But then, Victor, what do you do about shaping your mindset now around change? So you can either leverage an agile portfolio to capitalize on it, or if you're new to this market and you're probably thinking, whoa, I, I wanted to get in a property when it was booming, but it doesn't seem to be booming anymore. It might not be the right asset class for me. I'd probably say that this is probably the right time to get going. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, successful investing is usually counter-cyclical, right? So when when there's a boom market happening, which, you know, 2020, 2021, um, it was the property type that we are focusing on. Uh, in terms of grabbing the right location, the right type of property in line with your needs, your your financial footprint. Now that the market is changing, the strategy does not change. However, the opportunity type may change in the sense that uh, we may be looking for different type of opportunity in the same areas, in the same property type in itself. So this is where there is fine tuning of, of what you're buying in terms of the asset but you still have a very strong 
hard fixated approach towards where you're heading for the entire portfolio where you're heading for this new addition to the portfolio and what's the general plan uh, you know you don't want to deviate away from what your end goal is despite um, changes happening in the market otherwise what you'll find is that you're actually not getting to what you set out to achieve because you're you're not adjusting towards uh, what the market is doing you're adjusting more towards market sentiment or, or your own sentiment in itself and therefore you run around in circles and you never achieve what good fundamental approach investors would achieve over a longer period of time it's a good point vic you said something in there which i learned early on from someone who helped shaped my thoughts around investing and that is the market is between your ears mm, yeah always has been always will be and it's it's as simple as that something else to add though too is i think now it's a really good time for people to to watch their expenditure in terms of serviceability because clearly with the, the higher interest rates that erodes our serviceability but so too does all that other unproductive debt so there's a real chance that portions of the economy will tilt back towards credit card debt as things get tighter and as we all know that erodes serviceability like nothing else all personal debt does but here's where the potential opportunity is unfortunately that'll be at the at the whim of others uh, somewhere in the future all the new cars that people have bought over the last 2 years 18 months 1 year whatever it is with a 1 year wait and they still haven't got them what happens over the next 6 to 12 months when the cars land in australia ready to be settled so to speak do they get the loans can they get the loans if they do the serviceability is eroded or do we see thousands and tens of thousands of new cars sitting on the lot that weren't weren't taken up there's a good good analog with that with often playing properties right <clears throat> yeah, that's right in my head there's, i was thinking that as i said there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of people who have signed up for properties that probably settle or the finished construction over the next if that or if they can do and if the builder survives uh over the next sort of um you know six to twelve months uh and they're gonna have a pretty rude shock if they 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 paid the uh the retail price um in in mid 2021 and and when it actually comes to settlement it's you know cheaper you and know? you can't get the debt that's a double whammy correct mm. and we talked about opportunities in the market during the facebook live and and our last podcast so if you want to just go back to our last podcast and uh will we speak about where By we the think way, three or four areas you guys crystallized that really well i enjoyed that that back end of the facebook live i think you spoke about four different uh, opportunities, yeah, you know, not to give too much away. So go and tune into it. But like, you know, buying 99% finished stuff when people are yeah. gone, you know, there's some yeah. really good, there's some gold in that. Go and listen to it. And you know what? That's just a, it's a product of history repeating itself. It's, it's a, you know, been there, done that. We saw this happen. We were able to sort of execute those types of opportunities back in the GFC. Not that I think we're in that, but nonetheless, it's, um, go back and have a, Go back and have a listen. I was speaking to a, a builder yesterday, and he has a, a mate who's a very good builder, high-end builder. That builder is so concerned about being able to fulfill contracts. He's gone back to a few of his clients, which haven't started the build yet, and said, I will give you $200,000 in this case to walk away from the contract. So the builder is willing to pay the consumer $200,000 to it's crazy, isn't it? Let's let's rip the contract up. He's prepared to the damages on the contract. It's like a submarine deal. I think we, uh, oh, we just paid yeah. the French about eight hundred million bucks or something or other. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> and move when up. per the contract, we didn't actually need to pay him that much, but we just wanted to smooth things with our friend friends in France. So anyway, yeah, French friends. Yeah, yeah. So you're willing to tear up two hundred thousand dollars because that's a cheaper alternative for you than actually doing the build. As yeah. the most builder, of, most of them are losing money on these fixed price contracts now. They're going. You know they're all on the weather reckon there's negative equity with with most builders now and and most of them and then sort of soon to be insolvent like it's a big deal um but to back to the point around off-plan purchase or, or cars steve um uh yeah i reckon there's a lot of people sort of sweating it sweating it right, right now and, and it might they might hold their value but can you actually get the money that you subscribed into when you when you first uh you know, when you first signed on and that yeah. goes back to the point before you buy the property you need to be able to buy the debt and to buy the debt, you need to cross the T's, dot the I's, and look after your 
not just your credit rating, but clearly the household budget, because that's what the banks are looking at. Mm. And this is this is mm-hmm. that this is where the crossroads are at this point in time with escalating costs of living. Uh, you really need to think about that. Yeah. Well, you look at these interest rates, Vic. They, they reckon it should peak out at so two point five percent, right? Which probably yep. means you you're paying five five to six five five and a half mortgages, yeah. and the bank's going to put another three percent on top of that uh, for the buffer, right? So you're getting you're going to get serviced at eight point five percent interest rates. Uh, that really dilutes the buying power. Uh, it certainly does. Power. Yeah, it certainly does. One one of the things that we tend to we tend to have very short memories, right? So even if you look back a couple of years back, we were doing cartwheels when we were getting fixed rates at four point nine nine because the mm-hmm. variable rates were at six point nine nine. Uh, at that point in time. And, and we're not talking too long ago. We're talking about four or five years ago uh, in that sense. So what we need to keep in mind is that this low cash rate that we've coming off at the moment was part of an emergency measure to keep the economy ticking along as, as, as the pandemic gripped the world. And so you had all of the major economies drop their cash rates to keep things ticking along. And now we need to push it back to normalcy. Uh, so that where normal normal lies around two and a half three percent, and inflation needs to sit around two to three percent for everything to be in harmony. Uh, and this is where, when we are assessing properties and when we send properties for, to our clients, we are doing the assessments at four percent interest rate at a very minimum. Even though you could uh, arguably last year get rates at one point nine nine, we're still doing it at four percent because you need to be looking at it from a viewpoint of that's what the normal rates are. If you look at your average 10-year rate if it, from 2022 back 10 years, uh, it is 3.88, right? But in that 3.88, there was 7%, there was 1.99%. Uh, so it fluctuates all along. So you, if, if you did your sums on the average rate and did not take uh, sovereign incentives such as negative gearing into account, um, you can test, uh, you know, whether the test of time and hold on to your property because you've done your sums up front. It's all about doing the worst case scenario up front and then aiming for the best case scenario. And that's how you actually create an agile portfolio. Victor. That's it. It's not hard. Mm. And that's the, that's the key. It's difficult. That's the secret. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's not that <laughs> it's- hard, but it's difficult to get right. Well, it is, and it's it's difficult because it's a mindset thing, as you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier on, but also uh, the team of which is you know, vast and varied. Mm-hmm. But I think ultimately, is it a good time? Yeah, for some it will be, for some it won't be. Um, it's as simple as that. Is it the end of the world? I don't believe so. Uh, it's above my pay grade, but I don't believe so. There's too much at stake. And at the end of the day, if we look forward to carry on, then that should give us some peace, I guess. As long as we just address those real basic components, the cornerstones of life in terms of serviceability, investing, no matter what the asset class is, well, then you should be okay. But there's a big process. But, but Steve, you shouldn't be going, oh, should I be okay? I think once you work out, am I going to be okay or not, you go, I'm going to be okay. What am I going to do about it? How do I be proactive? How do I champion that sort of positive and proactive mindset? And no doubt that's the sort of people calling you guys up right now going, yeah, I've had a look at it. I'm going to be all right. I've got a stable job. I yeah. might get stuck in. Well, there's a key point, stable job. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, like that's a, a big part of the the confidence piece. And, you know, as we all know, unemployment is at extremely low rates, mm. lowest in many decades. Um, so that element is is strong. I think it's just more once again around, well, actually, maybe if I rephrase it, if there wasn't the escalating cost of living, let, let, let's just say we took inflation away, but rates were still going up, would there be a different narrative through the media? Or is it actually a combination of both? So people are more worried about their mortgages or are they worried about the the combination of mortgages and escalating cost of living? Now, it may sound like I'm being negative. I'm actually far from it. Yeah, this is for those that I believe are sophisticated investors, they'd be just sitting back and going, well, you know what? Now's the time. If I go back to the GFC, Vic, you'll remember this. We were super busy, yep. super busy, where 
the own its true term, the sophisticated investor came out to play, excluding Phil. It, um, <laughs> semi-sophisticated. Semi, sem, semi. I do note also, you guys gave me a bit of a hard time when I jumped on your Facebook Live. I thought that was, um, uh, it wasn't very kind. It hurt my do you know why? Because you give us a hard time on this podcast because you've got a microphone in front of you, but there you had none. You could only type. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't type fast enough is what my brain was thinking. Yeah. But, but, um, but I remember the point I made there, Steve, and maybe we conclude with with this chat. Um, I think I said, I reckon probably has already come back 10%. The number hasn't, the numbers haven't shown it yet uh, in Sydney and in Melbourne. Uh, so everyone's talking about this sort of doomsday scenario. Guess what? We're already we're already in this cycle right now of of uh, softer prices. Um, so if you're sitting around waiting for those that numbers to be reflected, go and speak to any auctioneer or real estate agent. They'll tell you. You, you guys are on the front line seeing it all the time, right? Um, mm. You know, so but not across the whole country. Not across the whole country. Brizzy's different. No. Um, absolutely, Adelaide's but, different. Perth's different. Yeah, but, but they're if all you've different. Been sitting around, and 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 I'd probably fall into into this bucket. Uh, and I need to chat to you guys about it. Is uh, if you've been sitting around waiting to get into the city market. This might be your time. Yeah, this might be your time. Um, yeah. So it's okay to buy on the way down. You want to try and get to the, the closer to the bottom as possible. But city prices are already down ten percent um, in some markets. They reckon that middle middle market is still holding ground. Like, what do you do? How do you pull the trigger, Steve? When do you know? Oh, I think anyone who can pick the absolute bottom or top of a market, it's more good luck than good management. Mm. You can get somewhere within a couple of percent of either way. Um, I think Sydney, I think there is some extreme value starting to appear throughout sectors of Sydney, not all areas of Sydney, just some, uh, especially towards the top end, I believe, and the bottom end, and especially now with the with the proposed stamp duty scenario and sort of underpinning the value proposition for that affordable corridor, definitely, uh, as well as the top end, but for other reasons. But I want to go back to to, to what I said a minute ago not across all of Australia, because as always, people tend to generalise you know, residential real estate as one market in the media, because otherwise it'd take up you know, 15 pages to dissect it. So I guess they just give it that general brush, mm. so to speak. And when you had an escalating market, you know, the, there wasn't a square inch of, or well, very few square inches of Australia over the last couple of years that didn't head north in terms of its value. But now we're getting back to normality there is thousands of suburbs of which in some way, shape or form, they will perform individually. In other words, there will be some that concede value. There will be some that continue to to go up. There'll be some that track sideways and every other derivative thereof. So now is the time to start isolating sectors of the market to bring out the truth to the forefront rather than just buy into what the media is saying in a very generalised fashion once again and it'll be those that don't educate themselves that fall into that trap mm, i agree and when you when you're buying real estate one of the approach uh, a safe approach is to assume that it's going to go south the minute you bought it and uh, you're not able to refinance or sell it for uh, you know and get your money back for the first 18 months not only that you've also got a high transactional cost your stamp duties, your solicitor's fees, uh, and your deposit stuck within the property. So this is where you really need to be looking at it more from a cash flow point of view. Now, I'm not talking about positive cash flow. I'm talking about affordability over here. Uh, so if uh, you uh, you lost your job, can you afford to hold on to the portfolio? What can you do? Uh, have you got your buffers set aside? Have you, you know, regardless of what rates you are on at the moment, have you liquidated or liquefied some of your uh, equity to help uh, you tear over your rainy days so that you're not always looking over your shoulders to say, okay, is there MAC truck coming uh, as, as far as my portfolio is concerned? So these are your fundamentals that you should never sway away from regardless of where the market is. It's it's all about the ability to hold onto your portfolio in the worst case scenario. And what measures have you put within the portfolio to perhaps boost your cash flow? Uh, what measures have you got in, in the portfolio in terms of diversification so that if you did actually need to trade out of it, you know, you, you trade out of a property that's in a more liquid market as opposed to a market that's starting to stagnate or there's less players in the market or values dropping uh, in this market. So they are fundamentals of property investing. And, and when, when investors come to us and they say, 
you know, where should I be buying? That's the question they ask. It's the wrong question. Mm. What they should be asking is what should I be buying, not where I should be buying. Mm. And the minute you are able to discern between the two of it and ask the right question, you are able to then set up your portfolio in a manner that then stands the test of time, regardless of whether interest rates are going up, regardless of whether the values are coming down, you still be able to hold on to your portfolio over the long term. Yeah. And maybe even before that, the question is, what can I afford? Yep. Because that'll dictate the what, then the where in that order. There's a lot in that. Um, What are people going to do, Vic, if they want to chat to you guys to explore a lot of those points? What's the best way? So they can go onto our website, writepropertygroup.com.au, uh, and uh, there's a contact us form. So once they reach out to us, uh, we will then set up a time. So first of all, they'll, they'll speak with Melissa, who's a, a seasoned property investor. And uh, she has many properties in a portfolio and seen that also the test of time. She will make sure that you are ready with um information with basics before uh, we set up a time to have a chat with either myself or Steve. And then uh, here's the reality, right? When you do talk to us, about 20% of, of a potential clients that do talk with us, we are outright saying that you should not be making a move right now, right? We, we actually look at your, um, your financial fingerprint, what you've got going for you and the threats that are coming your way and the opportunities that are coming your way. And then we formulate a portfolio based on our years of experience, having many years of many property cycles. And then we make the call to say whether you should or you shouldn't. Sounds pretty good. Rightpropertygroup.com. Are you Facebook? Right Property? Yep. All the Facebook, all the socials, all all that sort of business. And, And just before we sign off, once again, just going back to what we said earlier on about the other podcast, do yourselves a favor, go back and listen to the last podcast or the Facebook live where we do talk about those potential opportunities for some. Yeah, they're good. a really good way to frame um, strategically how you will shape this market. That's uh, Steve Waters and Victor Kumar, directors at Right Property Group. This is Investing Insights at Right Property Group. Any questions? Uh, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Any comments, any views, observations, um, uh, anything like that? Uh, we're really keen to hear it. And we'll, we'll do a Q&A episode at some point soon, Vic. I know you get a lot of questions there. Um mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably worthwhile answering them on air because you know th- this is a period of flux for for property, um, you know, and and you guys have been at this for twenty plus years. I've been at it for ten plus years. Um, expect change, accept change, uh, capitalize on change because that's what the best investors are doing. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next time. Until then, bye bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.